Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 45 of The Therapy Show, um, Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and Bob Cook. And this week's episode is all around working with the avoidant client. Correct. Yes. I've put my glasses on for this. You better had. I know people so listening won't see me do it. But uh, I can't withdraw. I have to have... You know, be present. Uh, maximum exposure. Yes. So come on, tell me what what we're going to be talking about with this one. Bob. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, it depends how you look at all this, of course. Um, you know, I mean, one way of looking at this is: does this type of time client ever come to therapy because they're avoiding in the first place? <laughs> Which is a, interesting. A, yeah. Paradoxical. Yeah. So if you look at my continuum of health, where we have traits or the worried well, if you like, yeah, they have traits right the way up to people who are very disturbed and quite um, sometimes quite psychotic. Um, if they're at a really disturbed level, they'll be so avoidant you won't see them. Yeah. But if we're talking about more the worried well side, more like traits, we will. Um, Okay, you could look at this in terms of attachment styles, of course. Um, you look at Bowlby's ideas of, on attachment. He, he talks about the avoidant client. Yeah. Um, and we could look at this in many different ways, but one interesting thing about this is this, these clients are often called the schizoid client. A schizoid means split. So that means these clients are often split from themselves in terms of internal contact. Yeah. So the externally manifestate, you know, the external manifestation is to uh, dissociate, withdraw, avoid, mainly because they're fear of, they have a fear of exposure. Yeah, okay. they have a fear of exposure. Uh, they're scared to have really close proximity with people and certainly intimacy. So these people will often be called self-reliant loners. And if you ask them, you know, what's it like being alone? They'll say, they'll say fine. Because they, of course, believe they will be keeping themselves safe by being alone. So yeah. they're quite comfortable with aloneness, which is very different from loneliness. They're two different yes, concepts. Yeah. I think regarding of the personality spectrum, they will all, or people will report loneliness, whether it's histrionic, borderline, narcissistic, all the different personality adaptations we talked about over the last 40 podcasts, maybe, will report loneliness. Where somebody who's avoidant, they'll talk about being alone and feeling quite comfortable with being alone. So two different concepts. Yeah. My understanding of schizoid personality type is that it's kind of like push me, pull me. Yeah. They, they come into the relationship, but then withdraw and avoid, but then come into it and they, they kind of, they're not always out, <laughs> if that makes sense. They, they make connections, but then they get overwhelmed, so then they withdraw. Mm. Yeah, at this sort of worried well sector of the a section of health continuum part of themselves part of themselves i think desires contact yeah but there's a huge part of themselves which is afraid of exposure which causes that pull push phenomena that you're talking about yeah and the therapy needs to be done when they're out not in yeah so, so maybe it's the clients that don't turn up one week and just disappear on you? Without... No, no. Okay. If they're highly disturbed, yes, because, you know, they they often will, you know, really stay avoidant and actually don't often come to therapy if they're really disturbed. If we're talking about the 
the, 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 the client who's withdrawn and but part of them still desires intimacy, um, they are likely to come to therapy and turn up and turn up and turn up because they know that, you know, there's something missing. Yeah. Somewhere. They're usually very passive, passive uh, personality profile. They're passive. And they expect the therapist to do it all for them. And that includes thinking. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, again, in terms of attachment, they will be avoidant in the sense of not that they won't come to therapy, but they'll avoid going to feelings and they'll avoid going to parts of themselves which they need to go to. They'll be dissociative. So they may actually be there. Yeah. Physically. Not, yeah. Yeah. And not contactful emotionally. Yeah. Physical intimacy, um, sex is quite all quite overwhelming for the avoidant client. And if they do have sex because it's required in the relationship, maybe from their frame of reference, it'll be very mechanical because part of themselves will not be there. Yeah. It will almost be like a, a duty function, but they're dissociative in the process. And this, this personality type or this avoidance is kind of from early childhood experiences or their upbringing, their past in some way. Yes, 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 definitely. And um, several reasons, of course. They may be in a family where that type of avoidance is modelled down to them yeah. by such processes as neglect or, yeah, or it may be a household where the actual caretakers or parents also are avoidant as well. Yeah. So there's not only is it modelled as a way of to function in life, but there's no physicality or emotions floating around at all. So kind of parents so emotionally unavailable themselves to the children that they, they yeah we kind of learn to just not have mm. expectations of emotional connection. Yeah. Well, it's modeled that way. Yeah. And those sort uh, that's that's high neglect or uh, that's traumatic in itself. I was thinking of uh maybe emotional physical trauma so the early child learns that physicality is dangerous so they go underground and they avoid um, emotional contact yeah. avoid physical contact and as the parents aren't um, you know really looking at serving the child's needs they're the only ones that can so they become self-reliant loners. Yeah, and like you say, split. Just that part of the self is is, yeah, forgotten about somehow. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it, it, they they split and they go underground, and they look to meeting their own needs, and certainly don't look externally to get their needs met. Yeah. So if you think about that type of profile, what do you think? How do you think they would be in relationships today? What type of person do you think they might pick? Is a good question to ask you for the podcast listeners. Well, I like everything in psychotherapy. There's this opposite sides to the coin. I would imagine that they'd go for somebody that's quite similar to them that also doesn't put any demands on them. Mm. Um, mm. That allows them to 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 go underground when need be. Somebody that's mm confident in themselves that they're not reliant on somebody else i would imagine it's like two separate people that are in the same circle but not actually connecting with each other or yeah. the complete opposite and they might want somebody that's very emotional well then yeah well, take, it's interesting the complete opposite um because they may look for people to do the emotional homework for them yeah 
and kind of like you said expect the other person to to fill in the gaps mm. for them and do the work yeah mm. so they might actually do that yeah um either way usually there's not much happening in the relationship and is that probably the reason why they will come to therapy often yeah and they often they often come being sent by their partner who um talks about the like a doctor spot character from star trek if you remember that yes Very yeah. but having no feelings or put it another way out of touch with their feelings yeah and it's got to such a state where the partner um you know suggests they go to counseling or therapy to try and address the problem yeah. so sometimes it may appear be because their partner has asked them to come but actually, I don't think that's a very good reason. It doesn't really work that way. We'll talk about that perhaps in another podcast. But you often get them that do, you, you often do get um, that situation where they turn up because their partners recommended them to come, especially yeah. in the schizoid phenomena. Yeah. And I or like the, the way you well, said, you know, Dr. Spock or Mr. Spock, because it's nice sometimes for the listeners to have. A character or somebody that they can associate this type of personality with because sometimes it's hard to describe it or explain it to somebody when we talk about shutting down and withdrawing in a relationship what does that look like yeah so the avoiding character yeah will have shut down part of themselves yeah so they'll probably just be operation operating to cognition yeah. It's associated and cut off from parts of themselves. Yeah. So what how do we work with, with this type of client then? Slowly. A lot of patience. Getting yeah. to know their getting to know their system. And it's quite one of the things is which is tricky is they're gonna get overwhelmed really quickly very close proximity or if you rush in trying to get to feelings too quickly yeah. they'll shut down even more so you make contact cognitively through their thinking yeah or behavioral behaviorally through their say passive behaviors yeah also i'll i'll be thinking in terms of unmet needs from the past you know the need for self definition because they've been defined so much um, the need for security, safety, because usually they've been neglected. Yeah. Um, so I'll be thinking of the unmet needs and how I pay a lot of attention to uh, continuity, predictability, uh, being a secure person for them, all those things which they probably never had in their history. Yeah. Which, like you said, it's it's going to be a slow process with somebody, because like like all personality traits, it's survival and protection. That's that's why they we all do what we do in order to protect ourselves from something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the avoidant personality, usually, uh, there there's no one to protect them, so they've had to protect themselves. Yeah. And the way they've worked out protecting themselves is to go underground. And what I mean by underground is split off their feelings and operate through cognition uh, or passive behaviours, really. So their inner child or their younger self, you know, they protect yeah. by, by not being in connection with it or not showing it. Yeah. I just shut this door for my dog who's snoring. <laughs> yeah. So there we are. So you don't all hear snoring on these podcasts because I've got a Charles Cavalier that snores like endlessly. I think they're so dissociated. You talk about avoidant personalities. Bless. Uh, maybe they, they go to an avoidant pl place when they're snoring so hard because they push. Um, everybody away and that's another thing about avoidant personalities of course they they push people away yeah by going underground by not 
being in touch with emotions and expressing emotions by being <laughs> passive, uh, basically by not being in the relationship. And then the other part of the relationship, the partner, uh, there's nothing to catch hold of because they're not there. Yeah. In terms of emotions anyway. I was thinking of a couple of clients that I've seen that I was wondering whether, you know, daydreaming comes into this, that they, I don't know, when they withdraw, they daydream a lot. They process their things internally through daydreaming. You, you know, yeah, when you're talking about being alone, but not lonely, oh. they, mm. whether that's a way of processing or self-soothing or having emotions in a detached way. Oh. But a couple of clients I'm thinking of that potentially are schizoid, they've both said that they daydream a lot. They, they dip in and dip out of reality, never mind the relationship. Oh. That's right. So... Daydreaming, daydreaming can be described as a dissociative function. Yeah. In other words, these types of people are very creative. Yes. They're very dissociative. That means cut off from themselves. And it may appear just like you've said. And they, they, they often daydream a lot, as, or what may appear as daydreaming. In other yeah. words, they've gone somewhere else. Yeah. They're usually very creative. And one way of, to work with these people as you get to know them is through their daydreams, their fantasies. But the, the real trick is to, how can I explain this? Is to be aware that you don't overwhelm them. Yeah. Because if you chase in transaction analysis terms, the child or the younger self too quickly, they, may well overwhelm and shut down and that means that you don't actually see the real self again for quite some time yeah so even though the person turns up and even though they're in the room with you mm. it's still that cut off part that is safe to show yeah. yeah so the trick is to get to the cut off parts it is to get to the creative parts it's just to get to the fantasies like you just talked about um but i i really believe that the bigger treatment plan is to get to know them slowly yeah. to look at their own relational needs to ask about in ta terms their script to be there to you see being there for these types of people just being there and inquiring about the younger self and the neglect or the trauma is very healing in itself because that is exactly what didn't happen. Yeah. yeah. These people are avoiding for reasons because their caretakers disappointed them, let them down, being neglectful, being trauma, you know, traumas around this process as well. So they're not, you know, they're not like avoiding for no reason. No, no. And so I think sometimes maybe that, could potentially be seen by their partner is that they're, they're being manipulative in what they're doing you know when yeah. they do shut down and withdraw they're, they're holding something back on purpose oh. what, you, what you might see that's interesting is you might see the avoiding person being in a relationship and this may, may seem paradoxical to you but anyway uh, being in a relationship with somebody in TA terms, it's got quite a high parent. Yeah. Now, then you would answer why. Why would somebody who <clears throat> has probably got unmet, unmet relational needs, uh, needs about self-definition or self-agency, unmet relational needs about security or safety. So why would they pick somebody who, or might pick somebody who may appear um, comes from a parent place a lot? And the answer is this, that the parent they probably attracted to at the beginning in the relationship was the nurturing parent who provided security, safety, structure. However, 
as the relationship goes on and um, the perhaps the uh, how can I explain it lack of close proximity the difficulties the avoidant person has of being in relationships brings out the other side of the parent in the person and then they go underground yeah so they go from nurturing to critical parent yeah yeah and then the avoidant becomes even more avoidant yeah and the really amazing thing is that the partner probably never knows they've gone till they've till till yeah. after they realize after six months where it's oh yeah where is this person? how can all these things we're talking about because they've got internally they're not in contact with they're protecting their child and often in couples therapy uh it, it's teaching the partner that the the person has actually cut off gone away avoidant because the other person has become too critical has demanded too much from the other person so they become overwhelmed and disappeared in the first place yeah that's that relationship and then the avoidant and you you said it earlier on the podcast can often pick relationships with other avoidant people and then nothing actually happens but yeah. it's comfortable for both of them yeah so they sort of function and rub, rub along, but nothing actually happens in terms of emotions. And for both people, if they're both avoidant, it's quite a safe relationship. Yeah, I think this is one of the things that kind of fascinated me. You know, it still does now, but certainly in the early days, that everything is kind of the opposite ends of the spectrum. It's either do you know what I mean there's two sides to every coin either somebody will pick somebody that's very similar to them or the complete opposite to them and how that impacts on the person mm-hmm. yeah and uh, and the more fixed their personality is in other words more trauma or neglect uh hence more disturbance you're not quite really likely to see them in therapy unless their partner has sent them or attempted to send them yeah so it's it's interesting because you know what you were saying that about being alone and being lonely you know that they are two different things and somebody Mm. would probably be okay being alone with this personality type Mm. or avoidant if you have two avoidance certainly but if but if you haven't so the avoidant person has picked somebody to do the emotional homework for them and also uh, hasn't been overwhelmed, but the relationship starts to go that way, then, uh, you know, you can't out, yeah, I can't, uh, what's the word? You can't out gun a schizoid. So as I say, they usually say, try and send them to therapy. Yeah. So the work that we do is, is very slow and steady, stability, mm. safe. Mm. no rush yeah get in through the thinking make contact through the thinking but the the long-term aim is to connect with the feelings yeah and the word the 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 word there is the one you've just said in the long term yeah yeah it's usually where treatment fails is when the therapist initiates too quickly See, I was going to say that when, when we talk about long term, what length of time are we talking when we talk long term? Well, I'm I mean, long term. Yeah, I'm going to probably f- may frighten off the podcast listeners or the video <laughs> listeners when I say two, three, four years. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. It's not long term as in six months. That That's relatively, well, it is short term in psychotherapy world, but yeah. And, you know, these clients that I'm talking about, that, that I kind of touched on earlier on, they're probably into six years with me now and religiously come week in, week out, mm. unless they're on holiday. Mm. It's an interesting one, though, because for the therapist, because these types of people are very passive. So the symbiosis with the therapist, uh, or, or, or in TA terms, the games that the therapist might get involved in would be about 
trying to think for them, doing it for them. And um, what happens then is that, that the therapist can end up in a what we call a codependent relationship, which could easily go on for five or six, seven years. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it's a tricky one, really, because the level of passivity for an avoiding client is very, very high. The hypnotic induction for the therapist or the projection onto the therapist is the therapist just does something for them, thinks for them, yeah. initiates things. So you've got a you've got a real, you know, you know, projection onto the therapist here. Now, if the therapist buys into it, you end up in a codependent relationship, which could go on for years. Yeah. And the therapist needs to do the complete opposite. And, and you know, and, and encourage the person to think for themselves and also to uh, say things like, give them permissions like it's okay to think and feel at the same time. Yeah. So you could get to the, so and things like, well, what do you think about your feelings then? Now, that's an interesting paradox for somebody who's avoidant. Yeah confusing <laughs> say that so, again yeah yeah, yeah think yeah. about your feelings, <laughs> feelings. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah so so when i say long-term therapy yes i might be saying three or four years but i'm really talking about you know really moving away from that symbiotic trap yeah avoiding plants will maneuver you into or attempt to move you into yeah i think for me, working with these sorts of clients, there's the temptation for them or the, you know, the attempt for them to do a lot of pastime in, in the session. Correct. To talk surface stuff and just pastime. Then yeah. they'll dip into the feelings and the deeper stuff and then come straight out of it. Oh. In, in, you know, the, the sessions where we have really done some good work on it, it's the relationship after the next session after they've opened up and really connected with something that they're kind of even more avoidant in that session as if there's shame or guilt or something around having expressed feelings. Well, you've said it. You just said the exact words there. Yeah. Uh, usually they'll go away. The defences come down pretty quick. And it's usually shame. Yeah. So it's kind of building it back up again. And then, it's you know, it's not one step forward, two steps backwards. We don't go right back to the beginning, but again, it's that safety and security and giving them permission and those sort of things after they've opened up. Yeah, the therapist needs to understand the treatment of shame with these types of people. Yeah. Because they're usually highly neglected uh, and they're highly shamed for being themselves. So, you know, they will tell themselves off for any expression of feelings. Yes, yeah. So they will shame themselves or they'll look to be shamed. So the therapist does really need, does very much need to understand a treatment of shame to work with the avoidant personality. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very interesting, Bob. I think we're going to talk about shame. I think that's on our list of things to talk about, which, which mm. is quite a good one. Because I think there's a lot of shame for the client in the therapy room when they're making changes or attempting to, to do something different, mm. particularly when we're looking at scripty stuff. So with the, lastly, with the one to say one plea for avoiding clients, and I know it's a tricky one, given all the things I've just said, but the relational need for initiation, yeah, usually or self agency, is usually unmet. In other words, as we grow up, we need to have permission to be able to define ourselves, take ownership of our own beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. Well, that is a need which is usually unmet with these people. Yeah. So the therapist if they understand relational needs needs to think about self-definition now what the therapist then needs to do is start to initiate 
conversation. So tell me a little bit about your thinking about your feeling or some way to start to get to that younger self and the avoidant personality. It's a very tricky one. I think I've said it twice on this podcast, but it's a very tricky one because the person gets overwhelmed so quickly and often feels shamed. So it's very, very, very gentle yeah. work. If you are going to initiate, <coughs> best way to initiate is also, also in, to inquire. So when I make this suggestion, is that okay for you? If I talk about maybe what you might be feeling, is that okay for you? So you're always checking up. Yeah the inquiry questions especially if the inquiry questions are aimed at the younger child yeah because those inquiry questions are keeping the connection if they're thinking and then coming back with an answer the you know the 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 possibility of them withdrawing at that point mm. is minimized by that inquiry question yeah you're keeping them in the it's room. <laughs> very, very, yeah. very gentle balance, though. And the therapist needs to be on the alert for if the client gets overwhelmed or shamed. And the best way to observe that is uh, by asking how they are from a query place and to look out anything that might sniff of them go them going somewhere else and not actually being able to transact back to with you from a yeah. feeling place so it's a very 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 sensitive attuned patient type of therapy with these particular clients yeah which again is you know it, it links into right back in the early days of you know getting to know the client and that initial assessment of the client and the treatment plan and all those sort of things it yeah it takes it takes time to build up that trusting relationship mm. yeah so thank you for that bob what we're going to be talking about in the next one kind of links into this a little bit i think is working with a client who doesn't know why they are there or doesn't know what they want from therapy. Oh, how interesting. Yes. I've worked, I meet lots. Well, I did. I've stopped working clinically now, but yes, I look forward to um, talking about that. Me too. So until the next time, Bob, <laughs> speak soon. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.